which is a stunning piece of reportage that offers a rare first-hand glimpse into Bombay's notorious sex industry and a vivid portrait of one reporter's journey into the dark, damaged soul of Bombay. The critic for this book is Mr. Chandrahas Chaudhary. Mr. Chandrahas Chaudhary is a novelist and literary critic based in Delhi. He writes a weekly column on Indian politics, society and literature for Bloomberg View. Chaudhary's essays and book reviews have appeared in The National, The Wall Street Journal, Foreign Policy and The New York Times. Mr. Chandrahas is the editor, India, A Traveler's Literary Companion, the anthology of Indian fiction. He is the author of novel Arzi the Dwarf, which was shortlisted for the Commonwealth First Book Award. Let's welcome Mr. Chandrahas Chaudhary to share his views on the book, Beautiful Thing. Well, hello everybody. I realized when I was coming to this festival, I got a few emails from the festival uh, saying that when we began, and I was, this was something I was looking forward to, uh, I would have to like, speak for 10 minutes about the book, like give a presentation was the, was the exact term used. And then a week later, I got another email saying I would also have to write, write 500 words about it as well. And when I came here and realized that Mithul and his wife were in a school and like many of the audience are teachers, I began to feel like maybe I was being set some homework and the proof of my seriousness would be if I did it. But, um, you know, uh, since we have an hour to speak about the book, uh, it uh, would be in some way like perverse of me to sort of route it for so long through the lens of my own reading of it. I feel when you're the writer in front of us and we have a chance to... Uh, dig deep into her methods, into uh, what she wrote, what she left out. I feel if we can talk about the book for a bit after there's the reading, and uh, if for some reason you're not persuaded at the end of an hour that uh, it's not a great book, then maybe I'll sort of like say what I think is wonderful about it. So but does someone want to come and read? If you have a reading ready? That's much better. I can actually see you all. Yeah. It's chapter four. Uh, from a very, very wonderful book. I just couldn't get com uh, come across the book. I just read a passage Sonia had uh, sent it over. And I really loved it because I'm, I'm a very fond of all realistic things in life and it really catched my eye and mind and soul. So it's a chapter four from a book, Beautiful Thing by Sonia Falaro. My mother is fat and very, very simple. A few weeks after I walked in on Leela's customer, I walked in on her mother's apsara, lounging with Leela on the bed, scratching her scalp with a toothpick. Mummy, they are my friend. Leela jumped up. She threw her arms around me and then stepping back, pinched my cheeks like I was a little girl. Ouch, I cried. Leela laughed with pleasure. You delicate darling. She said in English, you princess. Apsara stuck the toothpick down her kurta and beckoned to me. Come here, my daughter. She squeaked through a mouthful of gutka. I grinned inwardly. Her voice did sound like a tape on a fast forward. Uh, let me look at you. I joined Apsara on the bed and without preamble, she ran her hand over my face. Appearances are so important, she said. Pulling at my skin more than a goodness of a nature, she jammed a thick finger into my mouth, almost making me gag. It is the appearance of a woman that can decide her destiny. Apsara said, smile, and smiled, as though to show me how. The few teeth she had were grimy, with good cast stains, jagged like miniature peaks. She retrieved her finger and continued trawling the landscape of my face, stroking, pinching, prodding. Any time now I expected her to say, I wasn't worth the price she was demanding. Where do you live, Betty? she asked. I started to answer. Do you live alone? she interrupted. And what does your pitaji do? And your mummy? You're a Hindu, na? Where is your native place? You speak English so well, Betty. And English also, Leela was saying. Thank you, I replied. Where did you go to school, Betty? Here or Bahargaon? What is your job? How much do they pay you? I told her. So little, Apsara gasped. Is it enough for you, Betty? What are your monthly expenses? 
Leela playfully slapped Apsara's cheek and she smiled at me as though she said, you're a good sport. Satisfied with her quality check, live well, live long. Apsara spat into the palm of her hand and smoothed back my hair. Now, Betty, she shut spread, spraying all good on my face. I'm going to tell what my favorite TV shows are. You tell if I choose right, if I choose wrong. The similarities between Leela and Apsara were so uncanny. I was charmed. Mother and daughter loved to talk, each exclusively about herself. In conversation with Leela, if the subject somehow turned to me, Leela would tug at her hungnails and frustration. Was I there to learn about Leela or to be bore? Because if I was going to be bore, Leela's time was money. There were places she could be. P.S. had, in fact, just called her to invite her for a meal at Pure Veggie. She would have me known. But if I sidestepped this risk of being shown the door by conceding quickly and always, Apsara, Apsara never did. A conversation between mother and daughter, as I would soon discover, sounded like a peak hour fight over a bus seat. Leela would snap, sand, buffalo, poking her meaty finger into her daughter's narrow waist. Apsara would snort, hmm, Mariel, sickly. And yet, there was a grace inherent in their behavior. The hand gestures were as elegant as mudras, classical dance moments that amplify a point or emotion. It was a trait I had assumed had Leela picked up in a dance bar. But seeing her next to Apsara, their finger in ballet, I realized that genes had something to do with it. Leela had Apsara's nose. She had her mother's laugh. She was as inviting as the open doors of the night lovers or the New Year's Eve. Apsara had moved in with Leela just a day before. She had a warning her daughter without she had seen in a, almost a year, taken a fast train from Meerut and walked in on Leela's while Leela was asleep. Meera to heart attack ho gaya, said Leela. I had a heart attack. Apsara had bought with her several cartons of Meerut specialities including gachak and ravery. She had hoped these gift humble, though they were unworthy of her glamorous daughter, would distract Leela's attention from the two sizable rope tight suitcase they had been crammed into. Alongside clothes, utensils, photo in the frames and her favorite was with its clutched into a red plastic roses. But Leela missed nothing. Such big, big suitcases, she exclaimed. Only for two weeks? That was the length of time Apsara usually visited for. Only if my daughter throws me out, said Apsara. If she, if she doesn't, she continued quick as can be. Mummy will stay on, pamper to, to cook for her and wash her clothes, to do massage for her head and press her legs, to comb her hair 100 times every night. Leela attempted to demur. You shouldn't leave your husband alone, mum. You shouldn't leave your husband alone, mummy. You know that. You know why. It's been so many months, Leela. But you know what he's like, mummy. Give me a chance, Betty. And so Leela did. If only. As Apsara soon revealed, because Manohar had proved himself to be a rakshas number one. He had broken her finger. Imagine it. But he had done that before. Leela reasoned impassively, battered her so many times. The neighbors in the cantonment could only respond with a weary silence when Apsara insisted. She was unable to judge, distant and had since she was a child tripped downstairs as a matter of course. So why leave now? I can't knit anymore, said Apsara, throwing her large fat hands in the air. Tears rolled down her face. Pathetic, Leela amused. Manohar had pimped Leela and Apsara had protected his shameful secrets as though they were her own. But God forbid someone mess with her knitting. <laughs> I went to a doctor sahib, Apsara sobbed, but he said, it's too late, Mrs. Singh, you're too old, nothing can be done to straighten this finger, just manage best you can. Why did you do, Leela? wailed Apsara, knitting in my all, didn't he know that? The years are spent by his side and he couldn't see it. Now Apsara, calling 
Now, Apsara, caring little, we had only just met. And if anyone's presence in her daughter's flat needed explanation, it was mine. Launched into her personal history. She put aside her knitting, which she clearly hadn't given up, but despite the difficulties, the task presented. And to ensure my full attention hijacked my wrist. She moved this way and that, edging so close that I could smell her good cup breath. I appreciated its minty freshness, but it seemed she also enjoyed deep fried snacks. Every time my mister gets drunk, Apsara said, breathing heavily, he behaves like a buffalo rampaging through a sugarcane field. With God's grace, if I manage to run, all he can do is throw something in my direction, a chair, a stool, the knife. He insists on keeping his back pocket like he is, he's some here hunter wala. But he catches me. Hi, Ram. God says bye-bye. And the devil says, Apsaraja. Apsaraji, kya hal chal? <laughs> One limb at last goes crack. Leela rolled her eyes, Apsara is fat, and she's very, very simple. By simple, Leela meant stupid, but in a kindly way. My mother is simple, she would shrug. When I asked her why mother hadn't take, taken her away from Manohar, my mother is simple. She would comfort herself when she heard from her brothers that Apsara had spent her money orders on custom-fitted motorcycles and satellite radios on them. Leela's brothers were un unemployed and hoping to remain so. Remained in her STD calls as she paid for that they were paying for her health. Buy yourself a box of Shimla apples, they would instruct, though it was on them. Eat almond soak overnight for breakfast. Drink a quarter liter of cow's milk every morning. Leela saw through the solicitous of what will happen to them if I fall ill and cannot dance. She stuck her palm out. Madam, paisa dona. Dona, madam, paisa. Beggary. All of this Leela wanted me to know Apsara's attitude towards her son. Her son's stupidity and sloth. Who knew? Perhaps even Manohar's antagonism was a product of Apsara's weight and grit and the fact that she was unforgivably simple. Leela looked at her mother thoughtfully. Since I could see, I saw my father beating my mother. I didn't know ABC, but I knew that it was meant when Manoha threw aside his plate. That's why I ran away, because he abused her. Once he hit her so hard, she fainted. And because she didn't say no, he abused me. And I knew if I said on, if I stayed on, and if I didn't say no, one day he would do the same with my children. Now I see her sons had errated this same quality from their father. They think women are created by God to serve men like them. And that's what makes me angry. That she can see what they think for her. She can see it because I can see it. And neither of us is, us is, us is blind. And yet, it supports them. She loves them. She loves them more than she loves me. But why? Why? I am successful one. The one who knows, who feeds her, who clothes her, who asks if she, if she has taken her medicine. Why? I am the one who had the courage to leave the city. Where I am the one who becomes success and made money, makes money. Money, like a man. No, no, more than a man. I tell you why, because they are boys and I am a girl, nothing but a girl. The value of a boy's toys, that of a girl, isn't it so, mummy? Even if a boy is useless, Apsara wailed, that's not true. Yes, yes it is. It's not true, Leela. Okay, I'm not strong like you. You're not strong, that's true. But remember, mummy, your sons have wives now. You keep pampering them with my money so they like you. But what will happen to you if I stop dancing? Will they hold you as close? What will happen, mummy, when I decide that like them, I want to work and I want to be taken care of? I don't want to work and I want to be taken care of. One day, mummy, I will want to be loved. What will happen to you then? Your brothers are good boys, Leela. Don't empty your thali, mummy. That's what all I'm saying. 
you giving Sonia ji the wrong impression about us? Cried Apsara, throwing down her knitting needles in distress. What would she think? Sonia ji, Sonia ji, ours is a good family. From our side, at least, we are good caste. All our women have, have e either been housewife or in service. Cooking, cleaning, handy, bartan, vagera, vagera. No background. Not like other bar dancers. Lina knows what grandmothers. Grandmothers spend their life in Lucknow, Mujra salons. Chi, chi. And Leela entered this line. I said. Yes, Leela turned to Apsara wide-eyed. How did that happen? What can I say, Apsara redeemed, looking down at her hands. They were thick with gold ring presents from Leela. Leela was headstrong. She would make her own friends and had that big, big Hathi Mera Saathi years. She heard stories about Bombay of its bar dance and how much money you could earn. Imagine it. Money for Nachgana? Leela loved dancing. Did you know she won dance? She, she won every dance competition ever held in school. She, she was known as a Choti Madhuri after Madhuri Dikshit. Achha, remember Ek Do Teen? Ek Do Teen. Apsara sang throatly. Char Paat Che Saat Aat. No, Mammi! Leela screamed theatrically, sticking her fingers into her ears. Chup! Shut up! Oof. Okay, fine, I won't sing. Where was I? Huh? Uh, so one day, without telling anybody, this girl ran away. Just like that? Said Leela, sounding intrigued. Just like that? I ran away? Apsara ignored her. I ran away because I like to dance. Is it? I remember that morning very well, though it was how many years ago? Four, five years, huh, Leela? Apsara picked up her knitting. She was gamely working on a pair of pink booties. Her father had left the house without making a show for the neighbors. What relief, what change. You know, in those days I would serve him his morning cup of tea, trembling, trembling, really trembling. Anything could go wrong. The sugar was too little or it was too much. The milk should, the milk should come from a cow, not a goat. Why is the plate white, not blue? Oh, I can't tell you what a mad Rakshas he was. Much worse than now. But that day, he was quite a mouse. I looked up. Devi, have you answered my prayers? But of course, no luck. The only day after he was and he had always been. Shoving me back to front, front to back, like I was one of the cows Papaji had given him in dowry. In any case, that morning he behaved properly, so I went to Leela's room to tell her the good news. Who knows, I was going to say. Maybe our luck had changed, has changed. And I wanted to see her smile. Poor girl, the evening before Manoha did something too dirty. He had insisted on hand-feeding Leela, and Leela never liked that sort of business. She's very headstrong thing. She spat out the food. Manohar gave her one tight chop and shoved the food back into her mouth. What did she do? She vomited right into her plate. And then, oh well, you know what happened next to, for the love of God? Why are you making me repeat this story? This is not a Ramanan Saga's Rama and no need to repeat broadcast. Apsara Nod. Through a grumpy pause. Anyway, she continued. The girl here vomited and my mister shoved her face into her vomit and would let go until she ate everything. Until she ate every bit of her vomit, her own vomit. What was it now? Let me think. Bread omelette, henna leela? Now I can't remember, but just you imagine it. Imagine eating that. Now I, stopped what, now I suffered watching her. I couldn't move, I couldn't speak. I said to myself, God, wouldn't it be best to fling your humble servant under a truck? That would be kind of... No? But Leela's room was empty. Where was Leela? First I thought maybe he's gone to play. But after all, remember, Betty, she was the only child in a small chaddis, not even a woman. My mother is very simple, said grimly. Play, she glared, Apsara play, but Manoha started sending me to those mother chodes who would play with me, who would talk to me. Dirty girl, dirty girl, that's all I heard in Meerut. Mummy, you know as it well I do, play, it seems someone had 
played a trick on you. Someone had snatched your brains. Thank you. You know, one of the things about being a writer is that you get to hang out a lot with other writers. It's very nice. But uh, one of the problems about that is that when they do write books, then uh, it doesn't surprise you a lot because you already feel you can hear their voice. You know them so well. Uh, there's, there's no shocks involved there. One of the few times in my life when I felt like a friend of mine wrote a book and uh, I found every page sort of relentlessly interesting and fascinating was Sonia's. And uh, I hope to ask her a few questions. We haven't seen each other in four years just to find out like, what she did. Uh, Sonia, um, the first time I, I ever went to a dance bar was in your company. We had an ex excellent time. And uh, for a brief while when all these lights were shifting and changing and like it was green and blue, I almost felt like we were back there again. So maybe this is a special effect of the CLF. <laughs> but I remember in those days, um, you were working for a magazine and uh, the dance bars had just shut down in Bombay. They'd been shut down by the government of Bomb Maharashtra at the time. And there was a more immediate political edge to the matter. And beneath that, there was this constant question, which is also maybe possibly for you a feminist question, over whether it's fine for men to walk into these places every evening, spend their money uh, on watching, th throwing it at these women. And how for you, what for you was the point of transition where you decided there was something more than just a set of stories in there for, that, that could come out in a magazine, even as a set of portraits? Why did you feel there was a book in it? And like, was it just meeting the girl whom you call Leela in India? So just to quickly give you um, an idea of how I actually got into this story. Um, as Chandrahas was saying, I was working for a magazine. And I was based in Bombay. I would recently moved to Bombay from Delhi. And you know, if you've lived in Delhi all your life, the kind of freedom that Bombay affords you as a woman is extraordinary. It's incredibly compelling and you feel that you have to take advantage of that freedom I, I you know by freedom I mean a sense of safety where you feel you don't have to worry if you go to places far off places using public transport at any time of day and night I felt compelled to use what I thought was this sudden new privilege that I had access to and so I used to originally write feature stories I used to do uh, book reviews, etc. I was not very good. But, so the m moving to Bombay gave me an opportunity to move into reporting. And uh, because I felt safe, I could go to places that usually I think uh, women would not feel comfortable in because they would, people around them wouldn't let them feel comfortable. Um, so one of those places, for example, was Kamatipura. And, uh, and another place was... Um, the dance bars where I got to know, um, you know, the, the young women. And through the young women, I got to know the whole, the hierarchy of the dance bar. And I learned that it's an incredibly, very dense and layered world. It's a complete world. That was what was so interesting to me. It wasn't just that, you know, there was a dance bar and women went there and worked and then left. and continued with their life, it was once you became a bar dancer, everything changed. You spoke in a way that was very particular to the environment. You, the money that you earned, you did very specific things with it. The men that you went out with were generally from a very particular class, and they too did very specific things. It was very rich and a very unique world. And I remember thinking, oh my god, n no one knows about this. How fascinating is it? Um, and so I wanted to know more. And one of the things that I did was to talk to um, <laughs> a, a bar dancer that I knew. Now I feel funny saying I used to know bar, uh, you know, a, a bar owner. I, I feel now it's so long ago that I used to inhabit this world where my friends were bar owners. <laughs> but, <laughs> so there was a time where somebody that I knew was, uh, owned a dance bar. And I said to him, um, introduce me to some of your, the young women who work in your bar. And he was very smart, knowing that I was a journalist and knowing that I wouldn't stop at just interviewing the women. I would also poke around and find out about how the dance bar worked. He invited me to his bar, but he didn't let me meet any of the women who worked for him. 
So he told them to take the day off and he invited some young women who worked elsewhere. So his dance bar was in South Bombay and the young women that he invited lived in Mira Road. So the idea was you interview them for half an hour then you go your way, they'll go their way and no one has to know anything. Um, when I walked into that dance bar, it was in the middle of the day, so it wasn't, it wasn't open to customers. And there were these, at the, uh, all the lights were on, you know, all the disco lights, and the music was blaring, typical high octane Bollywood music. And there was a table at the end of the bar that was occupied, and there were four young women, four very glamorous, but very young women who were sitting there. And there was a um, waiter who was talking. And I noticed that he was talking to this one young woman. All the three, three of them were silent, and one woman wouldn't shut up. And that woman was Leela. Um, and I, I sat and I started asking them questions, and she was so, so charismatic, and so, so tragically young. And even being so young, she understood very well, in a way that I found profoundly painful, she understood how people saw her. She saw, she knew that men saw her in a certain way. She knew what they wanted from her. Um, she knew how I saw her. She knew that once she left the dance bar, she was no longer considered special. She was just somebody who lived in a chawl. And the rest of society treated her in a certain way. She had that understanding that was beyond her years. Um, and I just found her so so just so intelligent um, that I really wanted to, I wanted to know who she was. Um, and I think that, that happens very rarely, you know, that's, that's chance. Um, to just give you an, a, another example, diverging a little bit, the book that I'm currently working on, I knew what I would write, but it took me at least two years to find somebody that I thought was so captivating that they, I could write three or four hundred pages on them. It's very hard, ask any writer, to find that person who tells your story. But when I met Leela, I immediately thought, I mean, she is it. She is a book. But actually, I didn't want to do a book on her. It was once the ban happened that I felt I had to write the book. And the reason was, Leela was 19. And at 19, she was already saving money to make very drastic changes in her life. She had already made drastic changes in the life of siblings, of siblings' children, of her mother. She had improved their life through the money and the, she was making and the sacrifices she had made. And she wanted to improve her own life. But when the dance bar happened, she, was, she lost everything. She lost her money. She lost her house. She lost her job. She lost any chance she had of being the person that she wanted to be. And it was so wrong that some, uh, this, this whole idea that this mythical nonsense, this creation that women were somehow responsible for immorality, which is nonsense that we've been hearing for hundreds of years, um, as a way to deprive women of their rights. Because what was this? This was to take away her job. And the excuse was criminals go to the dance bars. And if you take a look at the crime statistics, you know that the crime has actually steadily increased because that's what happens in cities that are unpoliced. It doesn't, ha it doesn't happen because there are dance bars. In fact, a cop that I spoke to, I don't know if I've mentioned this before, he said, you know, at least when there were dance bars, we used to know where to catch the criminals <laughs> because once they made, they robbed somebody, they had all this cash, obviously they don't go to banks. Most of them are young 18, 19 year old men. Where are they going to go? They'll go to the dance bar. And after a couple of hours, they'd get so drunk, they'll pass out. By that time, we've already gone to the dance bar and we've picked them up. Now, where do we go? So that aside, that's not a reason to have a dance bar. No. But the larger point being, I was, the injustice of what had been done to this young woman made me want to write a book about her. Well, uh, it's, it, as, you, as you tell it, it seems like you suddenly had a lot of, um, Leela had a lot of faith in you also, clearly, to be able to, it's not like she exposed herself this candidly to just about anybody who asked her questions. It, it's clear from the book that she's talkative, but she also knows when to be silent. Oh, yeah. 
so, and it seemed to me like also in writing the book, you sort of repaid her faith in her because it is not at all, and this is I think part of the genius of the book, it's not a book about somebody, about a woman written from another woman who, although you didn't have to face any of the pressures that she had to, it was quite clear there was some sort of join in the book where the two of you understood each other perfectly to the point where she also liked playing little games on you just to see how you reacted. And at some point, it began to seem to you as well that you could also do the same back. And uh, underneath this, uh, the idea of a very serious exchange, there's this kind of sense of play and this complete trust, which comes through uh, sometimes very strikingly in very surprising things that she says, not just to other people, or not just, the, not just to effect, but to you as if to confess something to you. In a way, you, you're kind of each other's confessors. And I was wondering how, um, what it felt like to go back home from evenings like that, back into your much safer world, where uh, uh, and uh, whether this had some sort of any sort of permanent effect on your own life. I think it was really uh, well. I should uh, say first of all that um, I never spoke about this to I think very many people. Um, even my husband knew, obviously, what the kind of book that I was writing. But I wouldn't get into details. I wouldn't talk about it to friends. And there are a couple of reasons for this. Number one is when somebody agrees to give you, um, agrees to be chronicled for a book, particularly a book like this. The idea, the, the contract that you have with them, the unspoken contract, is that you, they are telling you this. So you understand their world, and you share that understanding with readers. But it is for the book. It's not, for, it's not some sort of uh, you know, tea time gossip. It's not meant to come up all the time. It is for the book. I never felt comfortable break, talking to people about Leela or about the things I saw when I come, came home, because that was not right. She was, it, what she had given me was very precious very, very precious. These are extremely, these are things that she said, because I told her I'm writing a book, she agreed. Uh, and it, it, obviously, if it was anything else, I wouldn't have got that kind of access. So I couldn't break the contract. I didn't want to break the contract, so I wouldn't talk about the things I saw. The other th reason I didn't talk about it was because I thought it was shameful for me to talk about how I felt when her life was so tough. How, how I feel seeing somebody in that situation is nothing compared to what somebody who is living that, who has that experience, actually experiences, actually feels like. It's nothing. I'm just viewing it from the outside. It seemed to me pitiful that I would come home and I would say, oh, I'm exhausted. I went up to Haji Malang. The stairs in Haji Malang are so high. <laughs> I had to literally be pulled up by some of the hijras who I had gone there with. It was very physically and emotionally tough, but I couldn't bring myself. I was ashamed to talk about it when their lives were, uh, were what they were. Um, I forgot the question. It doesn't matter. We've heard some very interesting stuff. I can ask you a new question. Um, I felt when I was reading the book that uh, the, one of the um, most interesting things about it is that uh, of course, we, you're attracted in the first place to a book about the dance bar girls because it feel, you feel that you will get a glimpse of this very beautiful and dangerous world, precisely about beautiful things that sometimes you may not have the courage or the resources to experience firsthand. There's that, that allure to it. But that, like, every kind of reader like, reads a book like this, and then uh, you find yourself not just sort of provoked, but also challenged in every page by various in, like, very shocking sort of moral reversals, you know, from this instance, for instance, for a while it looked like when Ava was reading that it could have been in some sort of comedy of manners between a mother and a daughter, the bum country bumpkin mother and the city slicker daughter in a peculiar way. And yet suddenly we like, suddenly pop into this memory of uh, the girl being forced to eat her own vomit as a child. And I think this occurs constantly throughout the book where um, a kind of laughter uh, a determined laughter from the protagonist herself, which is part of her courage. We always see and we, we can learn to enjoy that, like Leela knows of the, the sort of power of what she calls Nakra. And we sort of enjoy the constant play of like her trying to make things more interesting. She's a very interesting person and she wants every moment to pass by with some sort of like be embroidered, you know, by beautiful things. And yet she's also conscious of this dark, dark bit of her life. And you don't try to scant on either side and we're never quite clear 
on which side of the fence you're sitting. And mm -hmm. it's the same for the girl as well. It, she could be in the middle of something that she thinks is normal when suddenly she's bumped out into something uh, very difficult for her. And so th in a strange way, I felt the book was very truthful to the sort of texture of that life, which that things are very uncertain almost on a day-to-day -day basis. Your lover today is someone who will never pick up your phone call the day after. He has a new number, that sort of stuff. And there was something, I, I don't know, uh, maybe I, I'm interested in asking what you cut out from the book as well, because it's a very short book, and yet it seems very full of all, all these moments. Maybe you left things out to make it more uh, at the end to sort of focus on all these. It looks like so many things happen in 180, 190 pages. Yeah, one of the challenges was um, figuring out how to tell this story. And I wrote, um, and I, you probably saw some earlier version, I think. I actually wrote two what were complete books. Um, they were about 180 to 100,000 words that were completely different from, uh, I wouldn't even call them drafts because they were completely separate stories. Um, and so then eventually settling on this. And what I wanted to do was, like, like you said, just be very honest to how she lived. Um, and, and not try and change it to accommodate readers. Because um, I don't think of the reader when I'm writing. I'm only thinking of representing, accurately representing the person that I'm writing about. How you read it, whether you understand it or not, whether you are upset that I've used Hindi phrases or not, I never think about that. In fact, I've used a lot of Hindi phrases. At the last moment, I decided to add translations. I didn't want to. But I remember, I realized one thing, that if my father was to pick up this book, which of course he would, he wouldn't understand the Hindi phrases. Yeah. So I said, well, if my dad can't read like a third of the book, yeah. then perhaps I should make a concession to my readers. Yes. Um, so I did put in the translations, uh, but I didn't want to originally. And the idea was, you know, how do you, how do you recreate this stunning, shocking, beautiful world uh, on paper? It's very, very hard. But I did everything that I could to, to, to just try and do that. But it's, the arc is completely uh, true to exactly how everything occurred. It's just a matter of taking out certain things. I think that's the, a skill as a writer. You have to keep learning, as you would know. It's not every, you can put in as many things. There are 100,000 fascinating stories to tell. But it's not about how many good stories you can tell. It's about telling, finding that one story that says everything that your character would want to tell the world about his or her life. I felt also while reading that a lot of nonfiction writers feel that when you report a world, part of reporting it authentically is to sort of draw out its many levels, to like put in a lot of facts, statistics, numbers. But there's something a little more canny and much more striking and memorable in your book where uh, we kind of receive the vocabulary of these people while you remain at, in your own position from above them, sort of like looking at the world. If every now and then we are dropped into their, how they see the world through their words. And in a novel, if you were to write about a low class character and like spell, uh, when they say business, if you were to spell it as an Indian writer in English as B-I-J-N-E-S-S, -S -S, it would look like a kind of mannerism, a kind of like as if you, almost as if you're mocking them. Sure. And when you read Beautiful Thing, and the first few pages when you see business and class and things like that, you wonder, well, what's going on here? I mean, and then after a while, you begin to see that these words begin to have like a resonance of their own, almost to the point where you cannot go back to the thing of class as C-L-A-S-S, but only as K-A-L-A-S-S, -S, because they have layers of meaning specific to the way that the characters say them. It's almost like a, the vocabulary of a subculture. Right. And I was very interested in how you sort of both wrote it in English and yet, you know, there was this uh, lay a sediment of the bar dancer world language. And it's so attractive because uh, you can never forget exactly the way in which they look at the world. Yeah. Well, now it seems really strange for me to say this, but when I first started going to the dance bar and I'd hang out in the, uh, in the dressing room with all these young women, I couldn't understand a word they were saying. And that's r that I know how strange this sounds, trust me. Uh, obviously, I speak Hindi and I'd been living in Bombay then mm. for several years. So I understand Bombay Hindi. Yeah. Obviously, I mean, if you travel by auto rickshaw train, etc., etc. Just everyday conversation. 
I couldn't understand a word, and I thought this is going to be very tough. And a lot of the writing, a lot of the language that they use is, of course, I think at best, I don't know if there are still any school children here, so I'll say it's at best salty. So uh, I couldn't even ask, you know, without feeling a flush of embarrassment, what did you say? What did you mean? Because not only was I embarrassed, but then they would dissolve in giggles. And suddenly, you know, I wasn't even worthy of being in the, in the dressing room because I was clearly a fool. Um, but the language was uh, also so striking because once you enter the dance bar, you heard that language all around you, like birds singing. And once you left the dance bar, you didn't hear it. And that's why it was essential that that language be replicated. And I realized that somebody might read this and think um, it unnecessary or wonder if I am mocking when I use those particular spellings. No, it's because if, you, if I had written business as B-U-S-I-N-E-S-S, -S, you wouldn't have got it. You wouldn't have got what I got. And it was essential for me to make you, put you in that dance bar. You'll only get it if you understand how they speak. Uh, and, and that, I had to change the, the language for that. But I did think about it for a while. Yeah. Oh, it's interesting that you say this because we, we are, we, it's almost like we're sitting on the fence where you're thinking through your decisions and then from what we know of reading the book, we see which way you went. Right. But it was a doubt for you. And one of the best lines in the book is when Leela says uh, that uh, they think that I dance for them, but actually they dance for me, of her customers. Right. Uh, who also want to pursue her outside the world of dance bar, take her out, buy her things and stuff. So, uh, in a way, uh, like uh, one of the like fun things about the book is that it's about a world of male privilege over these women who come from very disadva disadvantaged backgrounds. But it's clear that much of the time it's the men who are being made dupes in this world, and which Lila knows very well. It seems to me there's only one class of men in the book who, for whom the bar dancers are the ones who are who are actually dancing, and that's the dance bar owners who are so inured to this universe, they know all the tricks of the trade. Yeah. So to them, and yet, they too seem to want to feel the need to have a dance bar girlfriend. <laughs> and maybe like, um, uh, I, I found it uh, sort of ex extremely charming when um, you wrote about this one particular balding, fat dance bar owner called Pushotam Shetty, and you write that he was cooler than a chuski, which I felt, I wasn't quite sure whether this was like, something that she had said about him or that you thought about or whether it was kind of coming together perspectives. Was that deliberate or is, are we supposed to understand this as a part of you know, the coming together of narrator and figure? It's, I, I don't recollect myself, to be very honest. Um, I do recall that, that particular scene, I remember, uh, just to very quickly explain this to you, Leela is having, uh, was having an affair with the owner of the dance bar and the dance bar was, used to be called Night Lovers. And the owner was this man called Purushottam Shetty. Mr. Shetty was in his 40s, and he was, as described uh, by Chandrahas, a rather large man with not that much hair left. It's not like a new him personally, but I'm going by what you said. Right. <laughs> as Chandrahas said, having read my book. <laughs> and uh, he was married and had children, but he was having an affair with, uh, with Leela. And that particular sentence comes from the time when um, Leela is getting fed up. She thinks that at some point, Pushottam Shetty is going to have to take this relationship forward. And in her mind, the only way to take it forward is if he asks her to marry him, which is not going to happen, realistically speaking, because Mr. Shetty is Mr. Shetty, and he has a missus um, and children. Finally, Leela says, you have to take things forward. And so he says, OK, I'll take you to Lonavla. And when he arrives to pick her up, he's in his van, I don't recall the specifics, and honking impatiently, and she's upstairs in her apartment where I'm sitting, and she's packing her bag, and she's got all these fancy new things, tight jeans, tight t-shirts, and he's downstairs honking with his music player blaring, and there was actually one of those chuskiwalas standing there. And I think that in that moment, he felt very cool. He was this guy, he had a young mistress, they were going to Lanavla, he had money. I think he felt on top of the world, he felt cool. Yeah. And so that, either she said it looking out at him or I thought it, I don't know. But that's how it happened. I felt it curious that a lot of these women had no illusions at all and this was like part of the dramatic allure to the reader that uh, somebody can be so candid and like so skeptical and so cynical actually. Uh, and yet, somehow some of them also seemed to want 
the need for a male protector or a willing to put up with abuse that was not from a family member or from an old, older person when they were weak, but also when they were strong. Did you ever find that this was maybe true of, of the general class or that there was something strange about this that you couldn't understand? I do feel though, so for example in Leela's case, she had been, um, her, her father used to send her to the local cops and they would uh, rape her essentially and give her, give, her, give the money to, um, uh, to her father. I, I do feel that with anybody who has been, who has suffered sexual abuse, the, you know, the rules are different from I think own. the rules are different and I think that the damage and the injury to that person is something that one, no one else can understand. And I, I do, like you said, the rules are different. Um, right. And it's just really hard to take any sort of judgment on that, mm. which one wouldn't do anyway. Mm. It's uh, one of the pleasures of reading the book is that uh, you forget during many conversations that there's a third person present, which is you. Which I think uh, is, uh, maybe I don't know if you think this is part of the ethics of non-fiction writing. Some people seem to feel that, I, to be more truthful, I must always mention that I was there. And another school of thought might say, you know, you write it as the characters speak to one another. If we completely forget, as during the scene which uh, was being read here, that uh, someone's taking note of all of this or watching all of this. Did you find that your being around also made people behave differently? Which is sometimes what we find when we enter a world which is where we are foreigners. You know, I'm sure that happened. There's just no way that you can insert yourself in any situation and not somehow change the, the electricity in the air, in a manner of speaking. Um, but I do also think that I was always around. I really had nowhere else to go. I mean, at this point, all I'm doing is writing this book. All I'm doing is trying to understand Leela's world. I have no other plans. So I used to just land up at her apartment and I was there all the time to the point where she, wouldn't, she was not happy with me. And to the point where she would say, look, please go now. And I just created several awkward situations. And as a writer doing this, you have to have a very thick skin because people will say, please, ab raat ho, ho gaye, chale jao kar. You know, don't spend another night in my house. Um, so you, on one hand, it, you have to imagine that something changes. On the other hand, I do believe that if you are around long enough, people uh, revert to behaving mm, naturally. Yes. Mm. Um, and, and what also becomes natural to them is the fact that you're writing. Because if you've been writing in front of them, as in taking notes, mm. or you have a recorder, that also becomes, an ex that becomes part and parcel of who you are. And if they accept that you are there, then they'll accept that those accessories are there. And they'll, like they'll forget you mm. are in the room, they will forget those things. Mm. And the situation that any writer wants to create for themselves when they are doing this sort of research is to be forgotten. And I imagine, I believe that sometimes I was forgotten. Mm. Did you wonder what Leela imagined your life was like and whether there was any truth to it? Maybe she romanticized your world, it didn't at all? Or it's not something that you ever got to? She never asked me. Mm any questions. Um, I think once she said, are you married? And then she must have said, do you have his, um, do you have his photo on your phone? Oh. Um, but she never asked. And I, I think she, I, like I say in the book, I think one of the thing, reasons she didn't ask anything about my life was because perhaps it was not something that would have made her, uh, I, she was reconciled to her circumstances. I don't think she needed to know that mine were more were better um, and number two she was a 19 years old she was a very vain young woman and like all 19 year olds she was mostly interested in just herself so I think she was at some level not interested also in anything that I had to say yeah I think you read the book and you feel very grateful that she's not interested in anything else because she loves narrating her own life and uh, uh, the like maybe like 30 or 40 separate occasions in the book where you meet her and yet we're never quite clear. We know the general pattern. She'll begin to talk about herself. She'll have all these interesting metaphors. But there's always new material there. And I wonder how you worked out the balance between, there is, of course, this focus in her. But it's not like we go through the book without knowing about the larger world of the bar dancers and sometimes about specific things that happen to specific other people. 
for instance, like four years later, I still remember that bit where about the bar dancer who's raped by her own son, mm. and uh, which in itself is maybe like a distressing fact or something terrible that's reported in a newspaper. But you go beyond that to showing her thinking or saying to somebody else, at least I'm, that this woman says to herself, I'm glad he didn't beat me up because my face remains the same. And if I manage to forget it, then no one knows about it either. Mm. And it seemed to me that you, uh, that was the most compelling bit about the book, that you looked at all these moral arguments that people made to themselves that allowed them to exist in this terrifying universe. And it seemed to su almost suggest that human beings are infinitely adaptable. Yeah. What for us is extremely terrible. Uh, that's not to say that it should be perpetuated, but that for somebody else, they can like, have this, to those who are that strength of mind that Leela also has, you just like shut the door on it and the next morning you're the same again, yeah. or you try to be. Um, it was very, one of the things that was very difficult about writing this book was, uh, about researching this book rather, was seeing people make these very, these very obvious mistakes, you know, like even somebody like Leela, even people who were very clearly incredibly intelligent, even people who had promised themselves that they wouldn't repeat the mistakes they had seen. And repeat, by repeating mistakes, I, uh, for example, uh, you know, going out with a customer who had a good reputation as a tipper, but a terrible reputation as somebody who was incredibly violent. The girls, some of the girls didn't have to do that. They had or they appeared to have choice because they were making a lot of money. But often they made bad choices and often they fell into the same traps. That was very difficult to watch. But I, I think that from the outside you can't, you can't judge. You, what is incredible for me is accustomed for them. And at some point I had just had to say, I, I can't speak up, I can't say, I, because their backstories are extremely, extremely painful, and often these young women come from places of great violence. So like I said, you, you really don't know what you're dealing with and how they see the world. The best way to write something like this is to just present it from their point of view and not try and force examination. Yeah, I think what was very nice about your book was not just the, all your revelations, but also your discretion. I mean, it's quite clear that you're not trying to evolve a theory about the bar dancer's mind beyond the obvious facts. Mm -hmm. People are left to be themselves as people. And not, even if people make similar choices, that cannot be explained, like, you cannot therefore say there's a similar reason for them making the choices. Mm -hmm. And after a while, we come to, like, respect people's own past inside this world. And also the way in which they explain things to themselves is very interesting. You almost feel like, you know, you have... A, in this very small world, a huge like, like tableau of human diversity. And for that reason, there's something almost redemptive about reading it, as if to say, in a peculiar way, I found when I read it, like in some strange way, also you f felt a greater faith in humanity, not a lesser one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, everyone talks about, you know, the survival mm. instinct. So I, I don't know that I want to walk down that path and say, well, they wanted to survive, so no matter what happened, they, they just started anew. I don't know what it is. I have no explanation for it. I know that if I was in those circumstances where Leela had been, where I had what was by my, um, you, you know, from my experience, an incredibly, a, a great future, um, and that was suddenly taken away from me, and I ended up as a prostitute on the street, I would have been completely destroyed. But somehow Leela could take that and say, mm, okay, well, what's the best that I can make of this? I'll just move on. I'll just start a different life. So I, I, don't, I can't explain that. I just know that these women could do it, and, and they dealt with it. So I think we're done. Thank you so much, everyone, for your time. Thank you to the organizers, Altaf. Um, thank you to CLF, and thank you, Chandrahas, for inviting me. Have a good evening.